It's one of the most bizarre biological experiments ever. In the 18th century, a scientist fitted a pair of tailor-made briefs on a male frog to determine the animal's contribution to reproduction. The process of human gestation was a mystery, and scientists had some oddball theories they were trying to check out. Although, you've got to give them credit for daring. Have you ever tried to put a pair of pants on an amphibian? I mean, a hat, maybe, but pants? I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this episode, life is a mystery. Consider, it wasn't all that long ago that we had no idea how babies were made, and today we still don't have a solid definition of exactly what life is. In our quest to understand, we're still at the frog's pants stage. But we are doing tests to find out life's limits, where it thrives and where it doesn't, and the difference may give us insight into how and where we might find life elsewhere. So we'll hear why baby-making puzzled even the most thoughtful scientists of the Enlightenment, why we're still arguing about whether we detected life on Mars in the 1970s, and get a tour of Earth's most barren places. So hop aboard. It's Frog's Pants. The summer of 1976 unfolded with a bang, and then another bang, and then fireworks, followed by parades and picnics and the renaming and unveiling of monuments. America spared no effort in its enthusiastic celebration of the country's bicentennial. But why shouldn't they? The build-up had come for months in the form of TV specials, newly minted coins with the outlines of the Liberty Bell or Paul Revere, spirit of 76 t-shirts and fire hydrants with added white and blue stripes. But if you were to shift your attention away from the patriotic bunting on the mall to the sober beige offices and computer monitors in the operations control center at the Jet Propulsion Laboratories, you'd find that the excitement and sense of accomplishment was just as high, even if there wasn't the sheet cake. NASA engineers were celebrating the successful July landing of the Viking 1 lander. The historic day was the climax to a long buildup as well. Many of the cheering engineers had imagined landing hardware on Mars since childhood. Now they had done it, the first successful touchdown of a spacecraft on the Red Planet. The mission of Viking 1, which was followed by its sister lander, Viking 2, included taking photographs and collecting science data, but most crucially, carrying out experiments to see if there was life on Mars. Now it seems like a straightforward question. Does the Red Planet have life or not? But it didn't turn out to be straightforward, and people are still arguing over the results 40 years later, says space historian Jay Galantine. That includes some scientists who participated in the Viking missions. Is that uncertain result because of the limited capabilities of the experiments, or of our understanding of life, or both? Well, there are some properties that life as we know it has. For example, reproduction. Life, even microbial life, makes copies of itself. But life, and again, that's life as we know it, is also constructed of organic compounds, molecules involving carbon. If you find life, you'll find organic compounds. But the reverse isn't always true. Detecting organic compounds isn't proof positive of life. I mean, sucrose is an organic compound, but no one would argue that a sugar cube is alive. Life as we know it also metabolizes chemicals because life needs energy. So it eats some compounds and excretes others. One byproduct of this metabolism is methane, as driving by a cow pasture will tell you. Okay, so there are some things we can look for that could be evidence of life. Organic compounds, metabolism. And maybe if you get enough of these clues, you might feel confident that you'd found life. And this is what the Viking landers did. They searched for the hallmarks of biology. They carried out four experiments. The first was a gas exchange experiment. Poured a nutrient solution, call it chicken soup, over a soil sample to see if anything was either breathing in or out. Right, so they're looking for gases such as oxygen or carbon dioxide. The other experiment was looking for evidence of photosynthesis. Right, the pyrolytic release experiment. Uh, They put some carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They let it sit there. If there were little plants in the dirt, they would take up that carbon dioxide. And because it was radioactive carbon dioxide, if they were doing that, we would know it by using a Geiger counter fundamentally. 
And then there was something called the labeled release experiment where they put a kind of food into the soil. Yes, but again, this was tagged food. This was food that had been spiked with radioactive carbon-14. So if anything in the dirt was exhaling waste products, they would be able to see that too. And then there was a key experiment, the gas chromatograph. That was the one that used a device to analyze what was in the dirt and see if there were any what are called organic compounds in there. Well, when you hear what's involved in trying to detect life on Mars, maybe it's not a surprise that there isn't total agreement whether Viking did so or not. Jay Gallantine talked with Seth at the recent Space Fest conference in Tucson, Arizona. And I got to say, I wondered why a life detection experiment hasn't flown on a spacecraft since Viking. And this was the most sophisticated attempt ever made to find life on a nearby world. And that was 40 years ago. It's been the only effort to specifically look for life on another planet. We've run all kinds of experiments on Mars and some of these other worlds that have looked at the chemical composition of the soil, that have looked at the character of the terrain and those kinds of things. But Viking is the first and only time where we put life detection experiments on another world. Okay, so now these weren't experiments looking for little green guys running around the the ruddy surface of our you know, next door neighbor there, the red planet, what were they looking for? They were looking for microbial life. I mean, what we would all love to see is video of an astronaut standing on Mars holding something that's wiggling. But the people who created the experiments really knew that if there's that, there's definitely going to be microbial life. And since it's much more likely, it's much easier to look for microbial life, so we'll start there. You know, in retrospect, I think most people assume that the experiment from the beginning was designed to find microbial life for the reasons you just stated, but also because the conditions on the surface of Mars really aren't of the kind that might support more complex life. But I I seem to recall Carl Sagan even opining that who's to say there might be vegetation, there might be, you know, small little critters running around. Absolutely. Carl Sagan was a vocal proponent of having as many options for finding life on Mars as possible. He wanted to put lights on the lander so that they could be turned on at night because I remember him saying that he had this fear that the sun would come up on Mars and the Viking cameras would turn on and there would be footprints out there in the sand, but we would never see this creature because it would be nocturnal. He also looked at putting bait on the landers some kind of food that would be set out to try and get some kind of critter to come over to the lander. And that never made it, obviously. It never flew like that. Uh, But those, I think, were were really some thought-provoking ideas because we we really didn't know what would be on Mars. I mean, I I don't think they were bad ideas at all. Well, uh, at what point in the mission did uh, the science team, or maybe more specifically the Viking biology team, did they, did they recognize that, well, we're not going to find anything uh, that's walking around, but there's still the hope of finding something in the dirt? That was very early on. That was long before the Viking mission was even approved. These experiments had been in development for years and years, long before the Viking project was even approved. So the idea was to look for microbial life from the very beginning. Maybe you could give me sort of a brief summary of the kind of experiments they did, because if somebody challenged me to find life in the dirt outside this hotel, I I suppose I would just dig up a little bit of it and put it under a microscope and see if there was anything wiggling or had peculiar shape. What, What were they doing? Well, there were a number of different approaches that were in the works at the time that survey was made. It was really a landmark survey, and one of them was a microscope. Wouldn't that be great to be able to look through a magnifying glass and see something that's wiggling? I mean, that's all the evidence we need. But that was eliminated from competition largely because the preparation of the slides would be something that was basically impossible to automate. Okay, so there were two Viking landers. They plopped down onto the surface of our little ruddy buddy there. They radio back their results and... uh, They were encouraging at first, weren't they? They were encouraging all the way through, I think. So the first experiment to report back, it had this massive oxygen peak, uh, which gave us a real clue as to the nature of the Martian surface soil chemistry. And that has since been proven out. We've been able to confirm that there is this oxidant in the soil that breaks down a lot of organics. That one never found any evidence of life. There was a second experiment which was looking for evidence of photosynthesis, and the second lander had 
a leak in that instrument that forced it to be shut down. But on the first lander, we had some pretty consistent results, some pretty solid evidence of photosynthesis-like processes that were going on on Mars. And then the third experiment was the most consistent. It was the simplest. It had been in development for the longest. Something like 25 years had gone by between the, the first conception of that experiment and Viking. And it was basically looking at the idea that if we give the Martian soil some food, and that food has been spiked with radioactive carbon markers, if there's something in the soil that eats that food, it will exhale those carbon markers, and we can detect them with the Geiger counter. Super simple, super reliable. It was consistent in eight total tries across the two Viking landers. Consistent in saying? Consistent in saying that when food is put into the soil, there is a response, there is activity. So those carbon markers have moved from the soil up into the air. And the only way that could be happening, simplistically, is if something was eating that food and respirating those carbon markers. So why is it that the Viking biology team finally concluded, sorry, it's dead, Jim? There was a fourth experiment aboard Viking that was looking for evidence of organic carbon compounds. We need those for life as we know it. If Mars doesn't have organics on it, it probably doesn't have life. And all of the Viking biologists had agreed before launch that if their experiments come back positive, but the search for organics on Mars comes back negative, there must be something else going on on Mars. So the results must not be biology, they must be chemistry. And so the attitude was, we would need to be forced into a biological corner, is how they put it. And the Viking experiment to find organic compounds, it came back negative. So there were four total tries across the two landers, and they all came back negative. And I, I think that's the major reason that we're not saying there's life on Mars. All right. Now, a couple of things. To begin with, one member of the team disputes that conclusion, thinks that, in fact, Viking landers did find life on Mars. Absolutely. So there was this man, Gil Levin, and his assistant, Patricia Ann Stratt. They had this experiment which was looking for the exhalation of the radioactive carbon markers. Their experiment was the simplest, it was the most reliable, and they feel that they did find life on Mars. And the reason that the organics weren't found by the other experiment is that there are simply such low levels of organics they were not large enough to reach the detection threshold of the other experiment. Well, that, that, that doesn't sound unreasonable. I mean, maybe he's right. Well, I think he is right. And just recently, we've had these results come back from the Curiosity Mars rover. It has much more sophisticated instrumentation on it than the Vikings. What Curiosity carries today is magic compared to what the Vikings had. Curiosity doesn't have a life detection experiment, but it has this extremely sophisticated experiment to look for carbon compounds on Mars, these organics, and it's found them. It's found them all over the place. And it's found lots of methane, which doesn't last particularly long. So only about 300 years. So there is something that is continually creating methane on Mars. We just don't know what. Could be biology? It could, be, could be geology, maybe? It could be. So once again, I think the major reason that we aren't saying there's life on Mars is we want to make sure that we're right about that. I think it's good to be cautious. I think it's good to maintain this attitude of forcing ourselves into a biological corner. Because as soon as we come out and say there's life on Mars, that will cue the naysayers and the conspiracy theorists and, and all these people who just jump on that answer and they try to tear it apart from whatever direction they can. So Jay, uh, I note that you mentioned that this was the only space mission that was designed to find life. Specifically, that's what its brief was. And even given the uncertainties, the fact that, uh, you know, who knows what life is and could it be life as we don't know it and all that kind of stuff, we have never done an experiment since to just look for life. And we were trying to find a trail to life, but nobody has dared to just look for life again. Is it because this experiment came back with a question mark rather than a definitive answer? 
Well, there's a couple aspects of that. Uh, Gil Levin and Patricia Stratt, their experiment was actually built and flown on the Mars 96 mission from the Soviet Union. That one, however, was not successful. But their experiment would have flown again to Mars and tested again. But I think the major reason that life detection experiments haven't been flown, there's a few angles to that. One is we didn't really know where to look on Mars. The Vikings landed in a place that wasn't necessarily the most likely to have biological life. The landing sites there, they were low, flat, and safe. Because a crashed lander doesn't do anyone much good, even if it does happen to crash in the most exciting part of the planet. So you've got to have something that's upright and operational. Also, I think the gray nature of some of these results, the fact that the results of these experiments were open to some interpretation, has really made everyone pretty gun-shy about flying a life detection experiment again. I, I think a lot of people figured that the results would be black and white, life or no life. It's sort of like being pregnant. You're not a little pregnant. You're either pregnant or not, and it's the same thing with life. They found it or they didn't but it was open to so much interpretation and so much disagreement over whether this is biology or it's chemistry, further complicated by the fact that biology is chemistry. Two really hard things to separate from one another. Jay Gallantine, thanks so very much for speaking with me. Thanks for having me, Seth. This was great. Jay Gallantine writes books about space and space history. Okay, so in summary, Seth, four experiments. Three of them would have been compatible with life, right? But this was not an ad hoc decision. They had agreed in advance that even if all three experiments, the first three, came back, hey, looks like there's something living down there. But the fourth one, the one looking for organic compounds, said, "Uh uh-uh, don't see any. They would have to conclude, look, we don't know what's going on here, but we can't say it's life. And that's what they concluded. And what they can say is though some chemical reaction was going on. It wasn't necessarily produced by biology. And it was because of that fourth experiment where the scientist Gil Levin takes issue with because he says that wasn't sensitive enough. Exactly. So he maintains, hey, look, the evidence was much better than people seem to think it was. Okay, so there's a possibility that the Martians are out there. Uh, they could be, yes. <clears throat> Well, Jay Gallantine says there was a proposal originally to take a microscope to Mars and see if you find anything wiggling. Well, that didn't fly, but that straightforward tactic was used by a 17th century scientist when trying to answer the question of where babies come from. Find out why that question was such a stumper not all that long ago. Next. It's Frog's Pants on Big Picture Science. Hi, Seth here. We'll be returning to the show faster than a buttered bullet, but first, we want to remind you that we need your help. Yep, our production may be more frugal than Montgomery Burns, but even so, we have to come up with funding. And that's where you come in, or rather, you chip in. Look, for every dollar that you donate, there will be a matching gift from the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation, which means that suddenly your generous and enlightened help has twice the heft. So before you check out your social media feed for the 400th time today, get on over to bigpicturescience.org, punch the ever so obvious button, and keep Big Picture Science coming your way. You don't want to emulate Mr. Burns, do you? bigpicturescience.org. Okay, it's perhaps understandable that when we went looking for life beyond Earth, we were uncertain whether we detected it. I mean, after all, we still don't have an airtight definition of what life is. And consider, it's only been a couple of centuries since a child could get a reliable answer to that question that every parent dreads and every child eventually asks, where do babies come from? Today, a fifth grader can explain the birds and bees, but at the time of the American Revolution, 
Even the founding fathers didn't know the biological basis of fatherhood. In fact, prior to the mid-19th century, leading scientists only had theories about gestation. Most would prompt eye-rolling today. But to be fair, it's not intuitive that a tiny collection of tissue and cells would emerge months later as a squirming, howling infant. They knew that people have sex and sometimes they have babies. They couldn't figure out what the sometimes had to do with it. Uh, They had no idea that women had eggs. They didn't know what sperm cells were. But the theories of the mostly male scientists were pretty certain of one thing, the male contribution to the whole business. A lot of them had to do with saying that the men did all the work and the women just horned in trying to get some credit. Oh, what a beautiful new baby, Anthea. Aye, Charlotte. Isn't she lovely? She's so... Ah, yes, Charlotte. She is a fine, hearty, and virile baby. No doubt owing to my daily servings of mutton and my hours behind the plow. Look at her muscle tone. The men had created these babies, and the women's job was only to carry them. "'Twas an extended labor, Anthea. You must be exhausted." "'Twas the most grueling forty hours I am spent. The midwife said—' "'Come now, Anthea. Hyperbole doesn't suit you. (laughs) Upon God's good grace, you had a pillow on which to lay your head. I am the one seized by fatigue. Charlotte, pray, fetch me some water. The bounty of mine own satisfaction has completely drained me." The man planted the seed, the woman was the field where this seed grew up. That was the most common for thousands and thousands of years across a lot of different cultures. Indeed, it took a long time to come up with an answer to the question of where babies come from and for scientists to realize their mistake in writing women out of the picture. But odd theories were kicked around first, says Edward Dolnick, author of The Seeds of Life. For example, did a full moon aid in conception? Was the birth of twins due to two rounds of sex or a very potent father? The bizarreness of the theories and experiments and the extended length of the quest is captured in Mr. Dolnick's subtitle, From Aristotle to Da Vinci, From Shark's Teeth to Frog's Pants. Oh, and a warning. This frank discussion of sex includes a discussion of sex. Well, the younger ears have heard it all anyway. A lot has changed since the time of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. Aristotle, who actually was an awfully insightful fellow and and made a huge number of discoveries in biology, thought that the fetus was a kind of hodgepodge of of agglomeration of semen on the one hand and menstrual blood on the other. This was a theory that, because Aristotle's name was prestigious from the get-go, had a lot lot of weight from early on. An awful lot of people believed it. This is all by way of, of trying to figure out what in the world the females contribute. That was a great mystery. And Aristotle's answer was was this menstrual blood connection. What about uh, the theory that involved the belief that maybe semen had some magical properties and could work somehow without physical contact? That was a big notion for, for thousands of years because people would dissect animals who had newly mated because you couldn't do experiments on humans, looking for semen, looking for embryos, nearly always finding nothing. And yet you knew that this mating somehow produced a new being. And so the notion was that even if you couldn't see the evidence, it must be it worked without physical contact in the same way that sunlight nurtures plants or the moon or the sun exerts a gravitational pull without physical, tangible contact. It sounds like some additional emphasis to the importance of the men in this process. It's not coincidence that in this day virtually all scientists were male and virtually all these theories put the man front and center and the woman as a a bit player at best. Well, you talk about, uh, you know, whether semen actually had to touch anything to produce anything. (laughs) But uh, that brings me to the story of the frog pants. And this was an experiment in which a pair of pants, or maybe it was boxer shorts, I don't know, were put onto an amphibian. Maybe you could tell us that story. Well, it's one of my favorite stories. There was an Italian scientist who was quite a brilliant fellow named Spallanzani around the time of the American Revolution. And he's trying to sort out once and for all this question of does semen exert its power in a magical, without touching kind of way, or do you need actual physical contact between sperm and egg? Uh, And he looks at frogs because in frogs, fertilization takes place out in the open so you can see it. 
So he takes his frogs, and what he does is divide them up into two batches. One batch of, of the male frogs is going to mate as natural, naked, regular old frogs. But for the other half, Spallanzani painstakingly sews these tiny little tight-fitting boxer shorts that he wriggles his male frogs into. And the notion is that the frogs that are wearing these boxer shorts are, are going to, in effect, be wearing full frog body condoms, and therefore the, the semen from those boxer-wearing frogs won't make physical contact with the female's eggs. And so the question is, which eggs will be fertilized? The ones where the male was carrying on uh, naked and frog-like, or the ones where the frogs were wearing these, these funny boxer shorts? <laughs> I see. They weren't up to the usual standards of Italian fashion, but what was the result of the experiment? I, I, I suppose I can guess, but I, I'd rather hear you say it. Well, you can guess, but Spallanzani was, was thrilled to see that in the frogs wearing boxer shorts, none of those eggs proved fertile, but with the frogs that carried on in, in their traditional way, those eggs were fertilized. And so what Spallanzani said is, look, no more talk of magic and occult forces. What you need for fertilization to take place is sperm and egg, both, and they have to touch physically. Again, when was this? What was the year, more or less? Uh, American Revolution, where 1776, something like that. All right. Well, obviously, it's a good argument for taking off your clothes during sex, I suppose. But 1776, I mean, there you have Ben Franklin out there proving that uh, lightning and electricity are the same thing. There were profound discoveries being made in physics and, and other areas of medicine, astronomy. And yet, this question of gestation, that was still proving elusive. Why was that? Fundamentally, why was that? I mean, clearly there was interest in this subject. Well, that's what got me into this book in the first place. I, I had written an earlier book about Isaac Newton and Galileo and, and the Royal Society and all this. And they had figured out how the cosmos work and planets and comets. And that's abstract. At least you can't touch these things and they're far away. And to talk about them requires that uh, Newton had to invent a whole new form of math. And yet that came about 200 years before figuring out this business of biology and where babies come from. And I was so puzzled that the hard question had turned out to be the easy one, and the easy one was so hard, turns out in short uh, form, is that life is complicated in the inanimate world, which seemed more forbidding and off-putting, was actually much more approachable. Yeah, well, the inanimate world, at least if you're talking about the motion of planets and things like that, which were the subjects of early study, those are fairly simple uh, compared to biology, which everyone knows is messy. But on the other hand, I mean, they did have animal models, animal analogs. They could see how their pets reproduced. Uh, they, they could see fish spawning and, you know, this milk going out into the water. I mean, it doesn't seem like it should have been that difficult. Well, what they could see is is the brute fact that it takes a male and a female, there's mating, and eventually there's puppies or there's frogs or there's babies. But what they couldn't understand is how in the world that happens. How is it that this tiny bit of tissue, presumably, at the start, within months, grows to be to be big, to weigh several pounds? How does it know to have fingers and toes and eyes? Where are those instructions? How does that come to be? Yeah, well, that is difficult, I suppose. And, of course, a lot of this did depend on uh, the invention of the microscope, which was, what, in the uh, mid-17th century, thereabouts, Antony von Leeuwenhoek, who did that. But before that, I mean, 100 years before that, you had Leonardo da Vinci making these really remarkable anatomical drawings of fetuses inside wombs. But despite that, despite his access to corpses in, in the hospitals, uh, that didn't help very much, did it? It didn't help enough. You got the the big picture, but not even as much of that a, as you would have thought. So uh, Leonardo makes a gorgeous cutaway drawing of a of a man and woman having sex. So it's plainly from his imagination because there are no MRIs or, or CAT scans for him to draw on. And big parts of that drawing are right, but big parts are wrong too. The, the woman has no ovaries. Even the greatest observers of them all, like Leonardo, miss big important steps along the way. All right, so let's return to Antony von Leeuwenhoek, who in the 1670s uh, used a microscope, one of his own, to study his own semen after making uh, love to his wife, I presume, and he concluded what exactly? I mean, he saw these little wiggling things, but he saw more than that. So, so Leeuwenhoek 
rushes out of bed one night. He's, he's as you say, just been to bed with his wife, and he uh, he he runs over to his microscope, uh, carrying this uh, goopy sample. He's thrilled. Uh, he he looks at it. He sees these millions upon millions of sperm cells swimming around. Uh, no one has ever seen them before, and he's thrilled. He's he's been looking for the secret of life. These little swimmers seem plainly desperate to get somewhere. They seem like a great clue. Um, if you're looking for life, this seems relevant. But did he not also see little tiny humans, little homunculi inside the head of the sperm there? Well, he didn't say that he could quite see them. He said that his microscopes were better than anybody else's. And so he imagined or thought maybe he saw within each sperm cell a tiny little passenger, like a space traveler. But he wasn't sure that he saw it. He said that down the road, as microscopes get better, quite likely That's what people will find. That's what he believed was in these sperm cells. (laughs) You write that the question of where babies came from became inseparable from the question of what is life. How so? Well, that is one of the reasons that things took so much longer than anybody had thought. When people first asked, where do babies come from? They thought this was going to be a practical question that had to do uh, with anatomy and tab A and slot B and that kind of thing. It would be straightforward. But it turned out that when you were trying to explain how a bit of tissue took on form and and grew, and, and then not only grew, but burst howling into the world, you had to explain what made some kinds of tissue different from others. What made a coffee cup sitting on your desk just a plain blah old thing, whereas the toddler who comes in and knocks that coffee cup onto the floor is living, breathing, pulsing with energy? What makes for the difference? Those two questions got intertwined, and the question about what is life is so hard that it made plain that what looked like an easy question was in fact wrapped up in a terribly difficult question. And to answer one, you had to answer the other. So this story of how life begins really underwent a sea change when German biologist Oskar Herkvig witnessed something dramatic in 1875. So as late as 1875, this mystery about where babies come from finally is answered. Someone sees sperm and egg actually meet. It's a scientist that nobody's heard of today, a German named Oskar Hartwig, who's studying sea urchins. Uh, It so happens that sea urchin eggs are big and they're transparent, so you can see inside them. They're, They're easy to watch. And looking at his microscope in 1875, watching a sea urchin egg and a sea urchin sperm, watching them closely, he sees the nucleus of the sperm meet the nucleus of the egg and fuse into one. And in the one moment of poetry in his long life, Hartwig bursts almost into song. He says it's as if he's seen the sun rise underneath his microscope. Edward Dolnick, thank you so very much for speaking with us. Well, I enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Edward Dolnick is an author, formerly a science writer at the Boston Globe, and his latest book is The Seeds of Life, From Aristotle to Da Vinci, From Shark's Teeth to Frog's Pants. Well, Seth, has there been any other subject in science where the theories have been as bizarre? Well, I, you know, I don't know what the bizarro meter would say, but for a long time, of course, uh, the origin of meteors was under question. Nobody figured that they were really rocks coming from the heavens. I mean, you know, rocks from the sky, nobody figured that made any sense. They, where did they think they came from? Well, they weren't quite clear. They thought maybe it had something to do with the weather, and that's why they're called meteors, as in meteorology, but, you know, that turned out not to be right. Can but, you imagine Imagine the umbrella that you'd need to protect yourself from meteors? Well, a meteor you could, shower? Well, you People don't use them even today when we know where meteors <laughs> come from. At least most people don't. I mean, you do see people walking around with umbrellas, but, you know, eight out of ten of them say they're not doing it because they're afraid of meteors. Well, on the subject of life, though, haven't there been some weird theories about Martian life? That there were Martians building canals on Mars, for Yeah, example? but that wasn't so weird. I mean, the guy thought he saw the canals, the guy being, you know, Percival Lowell, and before him, several Italian astronomers. And these were all trained astronomers. They weren't, uh, they weren't dummies. The trouble was that they had uh, optics that weren't perfect. And uh, so, yeah, they got misled into seeing linear features on Mars, which turned out not to be canals. But, hey, in some sense, maybe they were right. Maybe there is life on Mars or was life on Mars. So I, I, I don't fault these guys too much. Okay, so the story of the birds and the bees, we have that answered, check. The question of what is life, well, we're working on that one. We now know that life exists almost everywhere on Earth, 
but there are a few spots that are barren. Can you guess what they are? Take a tour of them next. It's Frog's Pants on Big Picture Science. Scientifically speaking, to say that a landscape is lifeless is an extraordinary claim. Given what we know about life, few things are actually lifeless, even if they appear otherwise. Come on, get off the couch already. Uh-huh. Do something. Go outside. Huh? Can you at least lift your legs so I can get by? Uh-huh. Get a life. Well, just about everywhere on Earth has gotten a life and has a hard time avoiding doing so. For example, you can scrub your face all you want, but it won't be lifeless. It won't be a dermatological desert. Face mites have staked out a claim in your pores. Same is true with Earth. In the majority of places we have thought were too hot, too cold, too remote, or too acidic for life to exist, we've discovered organisms that thrive there. Lake Vostok in Antarctica was thought to be an exception. Surely a lake buried under two miles or three kilometers of ice, cut off from sunlight for 15 million years, is sterile, sterile, sterile. But like a Houdini escape in reverse, something found a way in. Not that long ago, we spoke with microbiologist Jill Makuki in Antarctica. At that time, she and her team were excited by their recent discovery that a water sample extracted from another subglacial Antarctic lake, Lake Willens, contained life forms. Here's a clip of our exchange. When we went down with our sampler, we could tell when it came up, we would do a quick analysis in the lab, we would look at conductivity, and that would tell us something about the salinity, and we knew then that we had the subglacial lake water. And then together we looked at it um, under a microscope, and we were able to visualize DNA-containing cells. It was very exciting. So as a microbiologist, could you say a little bit about what this discovery means, finding life in an Antarctic lake? Why is that an important discovery? So for a microbiologist, I'd say it's not a huge surprise because we expect microbes to be everywhere. And now we want to know what they're doing. What role do they play in the Earth system? For the general public, why might they be excited? Because this is a new frontier. And the fact that there's life there, I I hope that connects the public to the Earth system a little bit more. Um, Antarctica just isn't a big frozen dead place like some people call it. It's, it's It's a living continent as well. And so it goes. Just about everywhere we look, life has staked a claim. Can the defining conditions of both environments, those that harbor life and those that don't, help guide us where to look for life beyond Earth? One thing for sure, life is adaptable and it's tough. Chris McKay is a NASA planetary scientist. The organisms that were found in Lake Vostok are microorganisms, microorganisms capable of mineralizing energy from not chemical sources, which is not surprising. If there's life in this lake, it's not using sunlight. It's using chemical sources of energy and bacteria that can consume organic material. Well, when you find microorganisms in Lake Vostok or you discover other extremophiles, are they often bacteria or organisms that you you are familiar with, or are they unique to that environment so that the there are species of bacteria that live in Lake Vostok that you can't find anywhere else on Earth? In a sense, it's both. In every environment, if you were to, to, to go into your backyard and dig deep enough, you would find bacterial species that are not found or yet been reported anywhere else. So the bacterial uh, life forms, microbial life forms in general, bacteria and archaea, are so diverse that in any environment you can find microorganisms that have never been reported before. Well, let's look at some of the places where life has been shut out in a moment, but just a couple other spots where we've been surprised to find life because there are some extreme environments on Earth and yet life thrives. One of them, which you've visited, are the dry valleys of the Antarctic. Now, these are remote places and they're extreme because they're quite arid and there's not a lot of ice, which is unusual for Antarctica. Tell us what you find there. The, the dry valleys of Antarctica are probably our best microbiological analog to Mars. And so we, we spend a lot of time down there. And it, it's really quite a fascinating story. Uh, and it's taken us uh, really decades to unravel the story. In the low part of the valleys, near sea level, it's dry. But during the summer, for a few weeks each year in the summer, it becomes wet. 
the ice melts and there's little streams and there's water availability, and life really churns during that few weeks a year. But as, as, as one moves up in the valleys, up to an elevation, say, about a mile and a half high, so you're quite high above sea level, still in the dry valleys, but now up in the high elevation dry valleys, it never warms up in the summer. The temperatures don't get warm enough. And there we find a place that's really unique on Earth. It's a place where water exists essentially only as ice and vapor. The liquid phase is not present. And here we find what could be one of the few places on Earth that is uninhabitable, that is that life can't grow there. Uh, nothing can grow. It's too dry for life. We've crossed the limit of dryness at which life can no longer grow. But it's not sterile. We find that there's organisms there. And how do we resolve that paradox? Well, what we think is happening is that organisms are just being blown in uh, by the wind and uh, so on. And so the organisms that we find there are transients. So this brings up our need to define some terms which you distinguish between is one thing to call something lifeless, it's another to call it uninhabitable, and then a, a third to call it sterile. And you make the distinction between those categories. Yeah, this is a very important point, and it's a, it's a point that's simple to explain, but took us years to, to figure out. Uh, the standard approach to microbiology is if you go into an environment, you look at what organisms are there, and then there's an automatic assumption that the organisms that are there live there and grow there. It took us a long time to to clear that assumption from our thinking when we went to these extreme dry environments. Because we would go there and we would find that there were microorganisms there, but they were not growing, there was no evidence of growth, there's no evidence of them doing anything. And so we, tr we had to separate the idea of an environment that's sterile, which means the absence of life or lifeless, and an environment that's uninhabitable. And what that means is that no organisms can grow. On Earth, essentially, we have never found an environment that's sterile in that rigorous sense outside what humans create in uh, autoclaves and sterilizing chambers for medical instruments. In nature, nothing is sterile because the winds and the waves and even humans track microbes and carry them all over the world, and they're just blown all over the place. Everywhere has got microorganisms on it. So the desk that you're resting your hands on is uninhabitable, but it's not sterile, and I'm assuming that the bacteria on your hands is flaking off, if that's what bacteria do, onto the desk, and they might live there for a while, but they won't thrive. Exactly. This desk sitting in this room is definitely uninhabitable. It's, it's too dry. The water activity is too low. There's no uh, reliable source of energy or nutrients, but that doesn't mean it's sterile because I'm sitting on this desk, and all this stuff is coming off me from my breath, from my hair, from my hands landing here. So if you were to do a swab here and look at the DNA, you'd find lots of it from myself and all the previous visitors and things carried in by the wind. But none of it's growing. It's not an ecosystem. It's not an ecology in any meaningful way. These things will just sit on the desk until, until they die. Uh, and in a sense, what we're seeing in the upper regions of the Dry Valley is like this desktop. And that's, that's very interesting because when we apply that to Mars, where there isn't a source of organisms in the wind, then that uninhabitable environment would be lifeless, we think. Well, coming back to Earth, I'll give you some extreme environments, and you can tell us yay or nay whether or not there's, right. there's life there. Uh, so just a, a couple that are fun. What about jet fuel? Jet fuel, if it's pure jet fuel, should have nothing growing in it because there's no water. If it's pure jet fuel. Now, if you've got water in your jet fuel, the organisms are very good at getting out that little bit of water in the jet fuel. What about bleach? Bleach uh, should be not only uninhabitable, but it should be lifeless because any organism in the bleach is actively destroyed by the bleach. So it's the, the bleach chemically attacks and destroys. So any even transients carried into the bleach are quickly erased. So it's a, unlike this tabletop, the transients don't even stick around long. So it should be both uninhabitable and lifeless and very good as a disinfectant. You keep coming back to the tabletop. I, I promise you after this, I will we will wash it down <laughs> for the next person. Okay, some natural environments then. Uh, now, now you said uh, if we if we dig in the dirt, we'll find some bacteria. What if we keep going? We're really persistent and we hit the liquid core of the earth. I mean, you have to dig for a while. 
You well, think you'll find any life down there? Well, in the if you were to dig and dig, say we started <laughs> in the Atacama Desert or the Dry Valleys and we dig, what we would have is this, this uninhabitable surface with some microorganisms on. But as we dig deeper, it would get hotter and hotter. And at a depth of a, about a kilometer, it would get so hot that any organism present would be basically fried and cooked. Now, you mentioned the Atacama Desert in, in Chile, which you've been to many times. Now, that is a place devoid of life. Is that right? And, and right. why is that? We, we think the Atacama Desert in Chile, the core region, not the whole Atacama, but the hyper-arid core of it, is like the high elevation dry valleys, too dry for life. Uh, it is so dry that organisms can't grow there, and the organisms we find are transient. What if you spilled your bottled water? on the Atacama ground, and then would there be sudden outcropping? Yeah, yeah you, could, you could change that in the Atacama fairly easily by just adding water. And in fact, when we do research there, you know, our motto is keep the Atacama lifeless. Don't contaminate it because bringing water and dumping it on the ground is contaminating it in the sense that it's opposite from normally we think of environmental impact as destroying habitat for indigenous organisms. Here, what we're worried about is creating habitat for organisms. Does rain bring life? And I don't mean the water, but the raindrops themselves. Are, can life be carried in, in raindrops? Yeah, light, the, the rain can be part of the global transport system that's carrying microorganisms. So we, one thing we're realizing is that there's a giant conveyor belt of microorganisms all over the earth. There, and we go outside and falling on you will be microorganisms that started off their life in China being carried across the Pacific by the wind. So the earth is mixed with respect to microorganisms. Large organisms obviously are not carried by the wind. We're not getting elephants from China blown into California. But microorganisms are so small, they're blown everywhere. And they'll be in the rain, they'll be in clouds, they'll be everywhere. And I believe that clouds are an environment, if you can call them an environment, that is devoid of life. Well, clouds will have life in the same, and it's a question is whether clouds can support growth. Uh, Are they habitable? Or So if you fly through a cloud and collect the raindrops or the water droplets, um, there's certainly going to be microorganisms in those cloud droplets. But are they just transients being carried around in the atmosphere? Or is clouds a place where life can grow? I, I sometimes phrase this question by asking, why aren't clouds green? Because if you look <laughs> in the sky, here's this drop of water. Uh, if that if that water was on the ground, it would quickly turn green from from algae living in it. Why aren't clouds green? So, from that, I conclude, you know, rather simple-minded and maybe a little too glib, that there's not a thriving ecosystem of photosynthetic organisms in the cloud. Even though there's liquid water, there's dissolved nutrients, and there's plenty of sunlight. The requirements for life, as far as we understand it, and this is only applies to the life that we do know because we don't know about the life we don't know, right. is water and an energy source. We can say that much about life. And some nutrients, obviously, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus. So life's got to have, it's got to have a liquid to live in, it's got to have bricks to make itself, chemicals, and it's got to have an energy source. These, this is pretty a uh, general requirement, I would think. Although NASA's mantra for hunting for life off of Earth is not follow the nutrients, it's really follow the water. Right, and th the reason why follow the water is such a useful strategy is because liquid water is what's rare. When we look on Earth, liquid water is plentiful. It's, it's everywhere. Uh, but Earth is very unusual. When we look beyond Earth, we see lots of energy, sunlight streaming through the solar system. We see lots of nutrients, carbon everywhere, nitrogen everywhere. What we don't see a lot of is liquid water. So that's what seems to be the missing ingredient. Well, finally, Chris, we began the show with a discussion of the Viking experiments and the debate that is still going on in some circles of whether or not they did detect life. Uh, would you like to weigh in on that and also give us a, an update of how that search for life on Mars has changed in the 40 years since. Yeah, I think the question of did Viking find life on Mars is an important one. And from a science point of view, I would say it's unlikely. It's, it's, a, it's not a hypothesis that we should follow up on scientifically. But now if you put on another hat and say, well, what about human health and safety? What about sending astronauts there? Do they have to worry about infection? Well, that's a whole different level of certainty 
we better be cautious. So, so this isn't the case of the known unknowns. It's a case of the certain uncertainties. That's right. This is a case of uncertainties and how you weigh them. And you weigh them differently if you're doing science versus if you're doing precautionary astronaut health and safety. Chris McKay, it's always a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Chris McKay is a planetary scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center. Thanks to the lively trio who helped produce the show, senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Daniel Marino. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky david and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including whether there really is life beneath the dry sands of Mars. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to the Big Picture Science episode, Frog's Pants. If you want to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, no need to theorize about how to find them. They exist in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because you think it beats the pants off podcasting, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. Oh, and to reach us directly with your comments, throw in some faint praise, and then email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. I'm thinking it's time that we had a little boy now. Anthea, add another pinch of cardamom to my blood pudding. Yes, dear. Uh, Meanwhile, I'll chop an extra two cords of wood. I want this boy to have character.